Hey, hello everyone. How's it going? Welcome to Ben's Camera Show on today, the 25th of February, 2021. And my God, I'm happy that February is nearly over. The warm weather finally made an appearance after some absolutely bloody freezing days here in London. And not only that, but the roadmap has been um, has been published for the end of the lockdown. Yay! We can finally go out and do something. Yeah, people can go out. They can go to restaurants. They can go to parks. Well, they could go to parks anyway. We could eat in cafes. Can uh, finally get out and uh, meet other people. Yes, that's right. And you know where I'm going to be? I'm going to be right here. <laughs> I'm going to be here playing with my cameras. Yeah. Lockdown pff, didn't make much difference to me, really. I'm just, uh, you know, I'm a bit of a homebody anyway. So uh, so here I am and here I will be. And uh, the end of this uh, this current run of Ben's camera shows will be, will pr probably coincide with the, uh, with the end of, uh, of, of all the lockdown and everything. Still, I'm going to keep at it, and um, the only difference is when I go out on a cycle, I'll be able to stop and uh, sit in a cafe for a bit instead of this horrible GTA 3 outdoor-only kind of existence that we've been having, along with the freezing cold weather. Anyway, I hope wherever you are, be it London or anywhere else in the world, you're having a great day. It's evening time in London. I've had my cocktail, so everything is looking rosy. <laughs> Ah, <laughs> oh boy, tonight. We've got a hell of a show tonight. Yes, we do. We've got an amazing show. Uh, after my, uh, my, my preamble and my what have I been doing this week and uh, a look at some very interesting camera, we're going to be talking to Phil Vigent of Pro 8mm in Los Angeles. He's standing by and he's going to talk to us. I say us, but uh, he's going to talk to me. But if anyone else has a in uh, question for him, I'm sure you'll, uh, you'll chime in on the chat. I certainly have got two pages of questions for the guy. Oh, boy. I don't even know if we're going to run, run long this tonight anyway. Anyway, 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 anyway. Let's start off with some amazing uh, developments I've been doing recently. Oh, yes. Some of us like to develop our own films. And you would not believe the kind of films I've been, uh, I've been developing these days. A mixture of fresh and expired, all sorts of soups and develop developers I've been putting them into. And I'm going to share all that data with you now. Um, firstly, there's no, no, there's no, there's nothing to, uh, nothing to go into regarding the last show. It was a, uh, it was a pretty good show. And uh, thank you all for tuning into that one. Um, no loose ends from that one, unlike the Soviet show, which, oh my God, there's, I'm still getting the, 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 uh, the feedback from the Soviet show. My God, a lot of people got a lot of stuff to say about the cameras from the old Soviet Union. But tonight we're going west. We're going to the new world. That's right. We're going to America for our, uh, for our, for our, our, um, uh, in, for our show tonight. Uh, amongst other things. So let's, anyway, let's go to the screening room. Let's see what I've been developing these recently. I did an amazing thing. I did a marathon. Where have I gone? Here I am. I did a marathon development. I did four films in a day, which, you know, considering a, a, a start to finish uh, Lomo Tank developing takes at least two hours if you know what you're doing. Uh, now, four hours in a day, two, four, that's eight hours of developing I did. I had a crazy day on Tuesday. And, uh, well, let's have a look what I did. What did I do? Firstly, I got some old expired Ektachrome 160. To expired in, I think, 1982. Good Lord. And um, I did it in ECN2 Color Developer. That's Color Negative Developer. ECN2. That's Eastman Color Negative 2, which is what they use to develop your um, your standard uh, your not standard eight I better better watch out with that word standard with uh, super eight negative. Um, okay, you're supposed to do it with uh, E6, but well, what the hell? I stuck it and it looked alright. I um, mean, it got a kind of an orange tint to the whole thing. Hey, is my mate Nile? Um, 
And uh, yeah, it turned out all right, I've got to say. I did it for 14, no, gosh, no, wait a minute, why am I with 13 minutes. Uh, 13 to 14 minutes, depending, I mean, in ECN2. Reversed it, did a bit of color correction. And uh, yeah, that, that, that old uh, ectochrome can actually be developed as a negative and uh, got a result, basically. Oh, that's on Hampstead Heath. It was so muddy. People had to uh, be really careful. They they're all walking around the mud there. Um, yeah, it looked great. And then there was a sunset. Oh, finally, I filmed an amazing sunset on Super 8. And of course, film is, uh, film is great for filming uh, sunsets and stuff. Uh, it wasn't quite as orange as you see it here. That's just the, uh, the expired film stuff. But here's a, here's a pretty good representation. Ah, look at that, of the sunset. Do you get that? Is those colors on digital? I don't think so. <laughs> Probably you do. But on film, it's extra special. It's the waning hours of the sun impressed on... Uh, there we go. That was lovely. Okay, so emboldened by my, my success with the ECN2 uh, developing on um, Ektachrome 160, 14 minutes. Oh, ah, at... 20, oh gosh, 21 degrees Celsius. I did not do it hot like on, on um, like you're supposed to do with, uh, with the, more, the more recent um, uh, new film. With, East, with the Ektachrome 160A, you've got to be careful because the emulsion will come off the film at anything other than, uh, anything higher than 24 degrees Celsius. So you've got to do it cold. Which is fine by me because I don't I, I don't have to do a uh, you know the whole business about warming up your developer or anything color developing at room temperature I like it okay let's have a look at some more room temperature rodenol rodenol in using Svema fifty like expired bloody forty years ago or so black and white seems to last longer Svema in rodenol just as a negative it looks fine it looks good. I like the look of that. I've got I've, I've another 18 rolls of this bloody stuff. So um, yeah, I walked down to Barbican with my lovely wife and I filmed a few things on the way. I'm into long, long like perspectives these days, like zooming all the way into long, um, long shots. It looks good. And that's at the Barbican. And uh, yeah, doesn't look too bad. Uh, apart from that hair in the gate, uh, that goes away in a second. I better look in the camera, see where that hair went. Anyway, that's Smithfield down there. Police going, wandering around, looking for someone to bust, who knows. And uh, yeah, yeah, that came out all right. That's, uh, that was UN54, that was fresh. Uh, no, that's not UN54, what am I talking about? That was the uh, Svema stock. Great stuff. All right, what else have we got then? What else did I do? Um, I did, uh, that's the Svema, and let's look at some UN54. I didn't shoot this, my daughter Lily shot this, but again, I plonked it in the Rodenol for six and a half minutes. UN54, apparently it's difficult to get hold of. I'm glad I got a thousand feet of it from Adrian Cousins. Fresh Super 8, fresh black and white Super 8, UN54, in, uh, six and a half minutes in Rodenol, at 21 degrees Celsius. It looks lovely. It looks great. Uh, she shot this on a on a Agfa Movie Zoom 2000. Lots of uh, still freeze frames there. Still frames. There we go. So you know that if you get hold of some UN54 on Super 8, just stick it in the in the uh, Rodenol. Uh, oh, that's at one plus 25. That's 40. 40 centiliters per liter okay so remember that's not 150 that's uh, one plus 50 one plus 25 so if you measure out get some rodenols dirt cheap it's like 10 pounds a, a, for a whole liter of it and i still haven't used up my uh, my current one stick it in some you uh st one uh stick 40 centiliters in one liter of water and uh you've got a you've got a perfectly good black and white developer right there lovely stuff right that's un54 uh, what else did I do? Oh my God, I was on a roll. Kodak 500T. Okay, fresh Super 8. Uh, this time I did it. Uh, this was again shot by my daughter, Lily. Um, 
Kodak, yeah, I did this at 41 degrees ECN2, which is exactly what you're supposed to do with this uh, Kodak negative. And 500T in daylight, in the dawn sun, it looks all right. I can't complain. 500T, they say it's grainy, but I can't see the grain. Okay, that's out of focus. Mind you, I can't blame Lily. She was That's her in the shot, so she wasn't filming it. And uh, yeah, it looks good. It looks a bit yellowish. I'm, I think I've color corrected it slightly, slightly blurred. That's a 500T, Kodak 500T. That's a uh, commonly available negative stock at 41 degrees, uh, three minutes and 30 seconds approximately in 41 degrees ECN2. And I've managed to capture all this, uh, all this larking about by the young people. So uh, yeah, looks good. And that was on a Agfa Movie Zoom 2000, which isn't even isn't isn't even set up for 200 uh, for 500T, and it still exposed it okay. Great. So we're already we're we're already ahead of the game. Uh, <laughs> and I'm getting I'm laughing because I'm getting to the bit where I get behind the game. Yes, indeed. Oh my God. Okay. All right. I've got a story to tell you all. Holy crap. All right. It's time to look at a camera. In fact, it's not just time to look at a camera. It's time to look at a whole system, a whole system of, uh, of, of camera and, uh, and sound. Yes, I know. It's not a sound camera. No. Let's have a look at, um, at, some, uh, at some comments here already coming in. Del G, that's the stuff I've sold you, Ben. Uh, no, no, it wasn't. Um, Del, you sold me some Agfa, and uh, that wasn't it. And, uh, but it looks good. And it looks all good. Um, UKS Off says, I, I develop a roll of that in C41 kit cold, just sent it for scanning. Good for you, mate. I haven't tried C41. I've got so much... Um, uh, uh, ECN2 chemistry that I'm just going to keep using it because it just keeps working. You know, it works on all the expired color stocks. It works on the fresh color stocks. You just got to do a test strip really to see how exactly how long, at what temperature it looks best. And then let the uh, the, the old computer uh, to do the, do the rest with uh, with uh, color, color um, not color, yeah, color correction. That's the one. Wow. Right. Oh, already some comments. That Alexander says, wow, that 500T looks great. It certainly does. Benjamin Marriott says, lovely footage. Uh, thank you, Benjamin. And Tio managed. Those all look great. Yeah, I had a really good day of developing. I'm not showing you the um, the slightly, slightly uh, rancid development I did. Uh, I don't know. For some reason, I think it was underexposed. I'm going to throw my daughter under the bus um, of, for underexposing some of it. And I didn't, I don't want to show you. I'm a bit like Ted Cruz here. I'm, I'm blaming my daughter for, uh, for my, <laughs> for my faults. Uh, anyway, God, that Ted Cruz, what a, what a tosser. Even, I'm, even in London, we know about him. <laughs> anyway, um, right. What was I going to get to next? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Right. I bought a bunch of cameras on eBay. And when you, not, not on eBay, what am I talking about? I bought them at an auction, a whole box of cameras at an auction. And I was super excited to get this next one. But firstly, I'm going to go into my little box over here. Goodbye. And hello. Right. Oh, let's get the, uh, let's get the background picture off and a nice white screen. This is what I got, everyone. I got, oh, you can't see because I haven't switched on the, the overhead camera. Here we go. Okay, I bought this thing. It's called a Synchronex Mark IV. And already you can see the beautiful wood inlay. Obviously, this was made, you know, back in the 1800s when they made everything out of wood. No, it's it's vinyl with a wooden style. You know, if you've watched the film Vacation, uh, you know the, <laughs> that station wagon that they have with the wood siding? Yeah, this was made about the same time. This was the time when you got into your wooden paneled station wagon and we got your wooden paneled Super 8 camera and you went and uh, filmed some, um, some films on, on wood. Anyway, so Synchronex Mark IV, okay? On this side, there isn't much except for this open and close switch which opens and closes the film compartment. And on this side, you've got, well, look at this. You've got, uh, that's your compartment for the light meter batteries. Didn't seem to happen. Didn't seem to work with any of the light meter batteries I put into it. 
Maybe I put the wrong light meter batteries into it. Uh, I'll have to check up on that. You know, I don't really care as long as I've got manual control over the uh, over the exposure. Here's your footage counter, par for the course. Here's your battery test. Um, even when I've got batteries in it and I press the battery test button, nothing happens. Uh, yeah, never mind. Who cares? I know I've got good batteries in it. Here is the auto or manual. You know, I'm going to zoom in a bit, a little bit. Why not? Let's zoom in so you can actually see what, I'm, what the hell I'm talking about. Okay, that's better. Okay, so here's your auto manual exposure. Very good. It's got auto setting. It's got manual setting. Uh, unfortunately, and it may be because I'm not, I haven't put the proper batteries into the light meter. Um, uh, nothing happens. It's stuck on the widest possible aperture, as is the uh, usual situation with cameras that where the light meter is broken. Uh, your light meter usually ends up on the completely open. So the light meter is completely open. Not not a deal breaker because I've got plenty of expired film and I shoot in plenty of dark conditions that the uh, you know a wide open light meter, yeah, like wide wide open aperture is not not the worst thing that can happen to you. Your focus. Uh, between 1.5 meters and infinity and the zoom between 36 millimeters and nine uh, medium kind of zoom so what's special about this camera why the hell have i brought this rather pedestrian camera oh here's run run lock for the uh, for the trigger as usual so why have i brought this rather you know unexceptional camera onto Ben's camera show because you know me I like to have the absolute best of all worlds well it's because of this thing you see this under the under the um handle there's a strange uh, socket there and also rather strangely it says sound super zoom see that sound super super zoom but any of you who, who saw and open the compartment uh, that's a regular size Super 8 compartment. That's not a sound compartment. Look, see, that's a normal Super 8 cartridge you put in there. What's the deal? Why do they call it sound? Well, the uh, answer is in the name Synchro, Synchronex. Okay. Uh, all right. What came with this camera? This is why I got excited about the camera. Is this a genuine Synchronex tape recorder. Yes, it's not just any old tape recorder. For those of you who are born um, uh, the wrong side of the millennium, a tape recorder, <laughs> I'm going to have to explain what tape is in a minute. A tape recorder is a, uh, a thing which, um, well, they used to uh, listen to tapes. This is before Walkmans, before Spotify. This is a classic kind of tape recorder and you used to be able to record on it and play back what you've recorded. Okay, good enough. Now the idea behind the Synchronex tape recorder and camera setup, there's also a Synchronex projector as well. Now, do you, are you starting to twig what's going on here? The camera, the whole system was set up so that you could record sound on Super 8 using a compact cassette. This is a cassette for any of you <laughs> watching who've never seen one before. You'd put your blank tape into the tape recorder. You'd start filming with your camera and the tape recorder would, you'd, you'd press record and play on the tape recorder. The tape recorder would automatically record the sound for your movies. Now here's the bit that gets really exciting, which is this uh, mystery plug at the back of the camera handle. And this also mystery plug on the side of the tape recorder would be connected. They would be connected by a wire and the camera would send the tape recorder a, a, a go signal to start recording sound when you started recording your picture. Okay. Now, the prop here's the way the problem starts, okay? Now look at that. That looks like a bit like a quarter inch jack. Quarter inch jack? What's that? What's that? A quarter inch jack? Okay, here's a quarter inch jack. Well, here's a, here's all the different types of jack. Those of you with iPhones won't know what the hell I'm talking about here, because <laughs> they've done away with their jack. Okay, this is a mini, a micro jack. A micro jack is smaller than your normal headphone jack. Okay, this is a, this is a headphone jack. It's also called a 
two, uh, 3.5 millimeter jack, and it's the normal headphone jack you get, okay? Now this is a micro jack, and you get it on a lot of Super 8 cameras. In fact, the end of this micro jack is this thing, which is a rather nice looking um, start stop button, which came with a different camera. Doesn't matter. You, the idea is you stick your micro jack into this little micro hole in, in the uh, camera and you press the button to, for remote operation of your camera. Right? So, micro jack, great, remote operation. Uh oh, doesn't fit. Never mind. Let's try a mini jack into there. Oh, doesn't fit either. It's all loose. It's too, it's too big. So, I know what you're thinking. Ah, what you need is one of these, a quarter inch jack. It obviously takes one of these, quarter inch jack. So that goes in, in there. No, it doesn't. It doesn't fit. Oh my God. Are we talking about some proprietary cable here? Um, unfortunately, we are. In fact, I'll show you. Get this out of the way. So that was the, uh, that was the system there. Now you see what we've got here is a kind of a, 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 a curly cable here that goes between the tape recorder and the camera. What's that curly cable? Unfortunately, of course, the curly cable didn't come with this, uh, this setup, the, uh, the tape recorder and jack. And not only that, but it didn't fit. Uh, micro, mini jack, micro jack, did none of it fit. So I did a bit of research. I found out there's another type of jack. It's called a 4.4 millimeter jack. I have never heard of one of these things before. Let's compare it to the other ones, okay? So there's your quarter inch jack. And I won't bother with the micro jack, you, you, but here's the mini jack, okay? So the one on the left, that's mini jack for like your regular headphones. The one on the right, it's quarter inch jack. Everyone, you know, everyone in the professional audio community uses those. And then there's this thing. I had to buy this separately on, not even on eBay. They didn't even have them on eBay. It was a specialist company sold quarter inch jacks. Luckily, they wouldn't cost that much. They're about five pounds. So I, I basically gamb gambled on the fact that, that, that this 4.4 millimeter jack, apparently Sony make one with five poles, which is very weird. So I gambled on the fact that that would fit into this thing. Does it fit? Does it? Does it? Yay, it fit. Excellent. All right, we're getting somewhere. So I fit that into there. And then the other end, well, yes, indeed, it did fit into the tape recorder. All right, now we're getting somewhere. Yay, I've got my cable. I've got my camera. I've got my, my um, tape recorder. Um, I can record on the camera, on the tape recorder. Okay, it's not going around yet. Just wait. And then when you hit the trigger on the camera, let's see if you can see what I'm, what's going on here. Uh, okay. Um, oops, it wasn't plugged in all the way. Oh, you know what I did? I did it wrong. It turns out this cable is kind of a one-way deal. So this end has to go into the tape and this end has to go into the camera. I have no idea why it only works in one direction or the other. When I start recording on the camera, uh, the, um, the tape recorder goes around, although, oh, for bloody hell, bloody hell, why is it not doing it? Okay, this is a problem I had many times over with this system, which is that the, uh, the camera, oh dear, uh, let me put it, put it this way. It's not a happy bunny, this camera. I'm going to put the extra mic under it and you can hear what kind of noise it makes when I try and film. Come on, do something. Oh, it's, it's, it's seized up completely now. Okay, it, it, it's got a problem. It's got a problem. In my camera, there is problem. Um, oh there, see, it's going around now. It only seems to go around when I'm pointing the camera in various directions. Um, and let's see if the tape will, will wind. There, there go. See the reels? It goes around. Just about. When the camera is going, yeah, this is not a this is not a happy camera. It, it, the motor is seized up somehow. So, but I was absolutely determined to get this thing working. Let's try and try that again. So it seems to work if I shake it around a bit. There you go. See, camera goes. 
Let's do that again. All right, camera goes and tape go. Tape goes. Oh. See, as I as I hit the camera, the tape goes. Even though the camera's not actually going, the tape recorder's going. Um. Anyway, the idea is is that you had to put your Oh dear, oh dear. You have to put your microphone into the tape recorder. Start recording. Just do it without the camera for one. Hello, testing. One, two, one, two. This is the uh, Synchronex tape recorder. Stop. Rewind. Stop and play. Hello, test one, two, one. This is the uh, Synchronex tape recorder. Stop. Okay, so the tape recorder works. The camera um, mostly doesn't work, but I have other cameras. So, I mean, let's let's see what I had to do to get this whole infernal system working. Let's go back into the screening room. Um, okay, I've named this file Synchronex. Okay, here we go. So, yeah, there's the camera right there. There's the cable going into the tape recorder. And here's some, here's something I had to, here's me, uh, you know, trying to record. <laughs> and as you can see, when the camera's work, deciding to work, there you go, it actually does, does do something. And um, here's some footage. I think first of all, I'm going to hairdressers. I'm going to Oxford Street. That's my daughter, I'm going to buy some summer clothes. I want to buy some shorts, and I want to go eat. I want to go to the neon. And here's after I got the recording. Um, so my okay. school starts in two weeks. So I need to buy some more pens because I haven't been writing a lot. I've been typing, and I realised how bad my handwriting has gotten. So I need to get pens and like try to do that again, and then okay. That's her well, talking that was the about whole Synchronex disaster or partial success, as I like. Okay, to well that's her talking about the end of lockdown. What she's going to do? Yeah, I, as you can see, unfortunately. Um, none of that footage was filmed using the Synchronex tape uh, camera recorder because it was just too buggered, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> I filmed that using um, a, a Lysina Super. And the last shot, the selfie shot, was filmed using, using a, uh, a Bolex 150, which is the perfect camera for selfies because, as I showed you in a previous uh, show, it it focuses anything from one inch to infinity. So it's a very good one for selfies. So yeah, a lot going wrong with here, I'm afraid. Um, in fact, the crimes of this Synchronex camera are, firstly, the aperture is stuck wide open. The, um, oh yeah, when you film, when you look in through the eyepiece, this hinge on the camera department, on the, on, the, um, on the camera compartment actually scratches against your nose, which is bloody annoying especially with a nose like mine. Um, oh, I didn't, I, well, for what it's worth. There we go, Synchronex Mark IV, it was called. Um, what else was wrong with it? Yeah, the eye cup, as, as I think this might have been an, a chin-on eye cup, it turned into black tar, um, uh, which I had to remove. The, uh, the motor is, is totally weak, even with absolutely fresh batteries. Let's have one last, oh, come on. No, nothing. It, just, it was on its last legs when I got it, and now it's it's on no legs at all. Um, it's got this whole ridiculous 4.4 millimeter jack, and um, yeah, it's uh, it's it's. Um, as some, someone said on uh, Benjamin Marriott says, "Whoa, there's 4.4 millimeter. Never knew that. Yeah, that makes two of us, mate." <laughs> and now I've got this useless 4.4 millimeter cable that's only good for triggering a Synchronex camera and a, and a useless one that is too. Um, and um, yeah, it's picky about what cartridge it wants. Uh, it, I, it used to work. It worked a little bit with this old um, Kodachrome. It doesn't anymore. 
the tape recorder. Well, amazingly, it rewound here on the show, but uh, up to now, it hasn't been able to do that. Um, it won't run if you plug the remote cable into it. It has actually a remote cable to start and stop. It won't run even if you've got the remote cable going. Um, the recording level and the play level are on the same knob here. So if you've been playing back and then you start recording, it'll be on completely the wrong place. And uh, not only that, but when I tried to plug this into my laptop to digitize the sounds that you just saw, it killed the laptop. It, it, I had to restart it and uh, the laptop went into complete meltdown. And it happened twice. So it's definitely this thing. I think it's outputting some sort of huge, massive voltage. Um, the camera, a piece of crap, really. I mean, uh, let's see, on eBay, on eBay, you can get one for £15.60. Uh, it says as is, meaning it's properly broken. You can also get a Synchronex movie projector. Now, I think the idea is that you were to put your plug your tape recorder into the projector. And then as it's projecting your film, it would somehow trigger the tape recorder. I'm not sure. Look, you know, this thing was a part of a huge job lot of auction stuff. So I don't know. I'm just going to sell it on eBay, I think. I'm going to keep the tape recorder because I like the tape recorder. Tape recorder is quite nice to listen to stuff. Uh, listen to tapes and stuff. Okay, it's not the super sound quality, but I still have old mixtapes back from the 90s. That's how old I am. And uh, so, yeah, it's quite nice to just just play. I would play some music on it to show you now, but, you know, YouTube and everything, so I can't. But, uh, yeah, it's, uh, you know, I don't know. I think I might sell I might sell the camera and keep the tape or sell the whole lot as uh, as as is. Uh, Del G says, hey, hate to be a party pooper here, but it's pretty easy to synchronize sound in post-production these days. Absolutely right. There's no reason to use a tape recorder. I might as well use a mobile phone or one of those uh, special sound recorders. Uh, alternatively, I can stop messing about with, um, with, with old cruddy equipment from, uh, you know, from eBay. I mean, anything that has uh, a picture like that well, you know it's it's something old. Ah, oh, if only, eh? If only they still made this stuff new. If only you could go somewhere, you know. If only you could have some sort of, um, you know, professional company that made that made new cameras and made cameras that you could you could rely on to work for more than two weeks. I mean, if only there was someone out there. <laughs> I'm working up to something here. Um, if only there was someone out there. Whoop. <laughs> if only there was someone out there who who could guarantee a professional end to end solution for uh, for Super 8. And that brings us on very neatly to my guest tonight. I'm so excited to have this guy on. So anyway, let me let me let me uh, introduce him. So the Super 8 world, and, and forgive me if I'm reading some of this because, um, you know, to get my thoughts in order, it, uh, sometimes it's better to uh, do it on, uh, on text, including the questions I'm going to ask him. But the Super 8 world has a number of colorful characters in these days, from wizards and alchemists, such as my previous guests, Adrian Cousins and uh, Daggy Brundert. And um, while we're making courtly metaphors, if I can be described as the court jester of Super 8, my guest this week is the king himself. However, as he's American, it's more accurate to describe him as the president because he is indeed the president of Pro 8 Millimeter. Now, Pro 8 Millimeter started life in 1971 as Super 8 Sound and since 1982 has been run, has been called Pro 8 and been run by my guest and his partner, steadily branching into every stage of the Super 8 supply chain from cameras and film stock to processing, digitizing, and preserving film as a medium. They were the first to cut down no Kodak negative stock for Super 8. You heard it here first. They were the first ones to do it, not Kodak. They took Kodak 35 mil, cut it down for Super 8, and sold it in, uh, before Kodak did it. And um, as the Super 8 industry underwent cataclysmic changes in the last 40 years, one name has been a constant reminder to industry and amateur filmmakers alike that the format was alive and kicking. 
Looking to the future, he has been at the forefront of training tomorrow's filmmakers and raising awareness of Super 8 and other small formats, as well as leading the field in research into new ways of using the format. He is the author of The Power of Super 8 Film and known throughout the industry as a fountain of knowledge that he is always willing to share with both expert and novice. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Phil Vigent. Phil. Hey, that's one hell of a good intro. <laughs> yeah, I like, I like to do a whole rundown of everyone I have on the show. It's, uh, how are you doing? How's, thing, how's things in uh, Los Angeles? Like yourself, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a hermit too, so I, none of these problems have really affected me too much. You mm. know, I go into my cave and, and do my thing and then go home, so lockdown hasn't really bothered me as much as it has other people. Excellent. Yeah, me too. Me too. Although I wish my cave had what's behind you there. That's a very <laughs> impressive looking digitizing machine. Yeah, it's nice to have a really nice 6.5K scanner in your uh, in your office. Oh, you know, it's man. It's handy you know, when you're doing your work. Oh God, it puts my little Wolverine to shame. Anyway, <laughs> so, um, I Phil, I, sorry, I didn't hear. What'd you, you say? You got to start somewhere. Right? Yeah, 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 I know, I know, right. I know, I know. Eventually I might move up to a, 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 a what was it called? A retro scan. And, uh, you know, from there, I don't know, I'd have to talk my wife into agreeing to buy something more com it's complex pretty, than that. It's pretty much the way it works. You know, I, I think my first, I, I used to build telecines, you know, back in the, must have been the early 80s. That was one of the first parts of this that we got involved with, you mm. know, that I, I, you know, did technically. Mm. And we were putting like five-bladed shutter project, uh, uh, five-bladed shutters in projectors so we could transfer it 24. And then we were varying the speed, you know, oh, to 20 God. frames per second so that we could transfer 18 and mm. you know, do all these things, you know, to make the whole process of film to, uh, video kind of work mm. uh, for a personal kind of thing. So, mm. uh, well, you know, I know that world of starting out, you know, with the with the least expensive way of doing it. Mm. Mm. And over time, you know, you just keep sort of progressing. Mm. And, uh, you know, we went from that to, I think we used a Sony BM2100, which mm. had like a synchronizing capacity between the film and the video. So we could do very speeds and Wow. From that to ranks and then high speed ranks and yeah, I think my wife is about ready to throw me out when I bought the Millennium. You know, it's almost a million dollars, you know, on a, a piece of equipment to scan film. Whoa. <laughs> so, uh, well, you know. actually that to that end, that's an interesting um a point you make up. But is your end ambition to give your know, Super 8 cameras all the functionality of 16 mil and to make Super 8 look as absolute sharp and high res as possible uh definitely as sharp and as high res as possible i don't know about trying to imitate 16 i mean i spent a lot of years trying to do that i mean that was probably the goal for probably a decade of my life is just like how can we make a cheaper version of 16 mm. and at some point in the music video um era we started to realize that super 8 had its own character its own reason to be and that it was much more important than just being a cheap knockoff of 16 mm -hmm. and that you could do different things with it that you couldn't really do at 16. ah that so, that brings me on to my my next question which is that what is it about small format film that makes it so special uh there's some combination of the ease of use that, that it's accessible to everyone so it doesn't take the knowledge base that larger film formats need so you can take someone who's really not technically inclined and they can still use it so it, it diversifies the medium amongst all kinds of people from young very young people to you know like i say people who don't really like technical but still have amazing aesthetic judgment so they can work with it because it's not that technical and still come up with unbelievably beautiful images because they understand, you know, the the aesthetics of the image, not mm. the technical of running a camera. Well, so are we really are we seeing an 
are we seeing an increase in the number of people using it Super 8 again for home movies and, and special effects? Uh, we're definitely seeing more people using Super 8 than ever. Mm -hmm. um, they're probably using no more Super 8 than we have been using because they use less of it. And they do mm. very creative things with very little amounts of film. Mm. So in the past, you would have had, you know, an average, let's say the wedding market, you'd, you'd have an average guy working on a wedding, shooting six to 10 rolls of film. Uh, and you had X number of those guys. And now you have 10 times that many people doing it, but they're all using one roll of film to do their wedding. Mm. So the, the numbers of people involved here have gone up exponentially, but really? they're, they've all discovered ways of using very small quantities of film for the economics to work. Yeah. Well, you're, you're in a unique position of, of, of catering to the domestic and the uh, professional, the industry as well. Um, yeah. So what part does Super 8 play in the, in the professional sphere these days? Um, so... Everything from, you know, we worked on like Star Wars like a couple of years ago to, you know, so at, at that level, you know, Chris Nolan kind of stuff um, occasionally uses, you know, all kinds of media to, to do maybe just one shot, you know, in a movie. So wow. having that diversity here in Hollywood of all these medias uh, makes it so that, you know, we can participate in in major motion pictures with uh, some shot or scene or opening title credit with like, uh, you know, a hundred million dollar film could have Super 8 in it. That's that's so, fascinating to me. How I, I've, I had no idea that, that, I mean, okay, I know that the Super 8 look is, is sought after by, you know, music videos and advertisements and stuff, but I had no idea other than, you know, the obvious Steven Spielberg Super 8 film. Um, yeah. I had no idea that the that, that productions like, Star Wars and, and directors like Chris Nolan were actually using Super 8. Yeah, you know, there's like like scene insert shots, you know, things that you just like a very small part, but you know, when you're doing a major motion picture where one special effect shot might be a half a million dollars, uh, it's worth getting authentic if you want to have, um, Let's say Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, for example, there's a scene in there where uh, they're in uh, the pool out back and uh, there's some conversation about, you know, the, the past and, and a whole movie comes up, you know, mm. to, to support the, you know, the narrative that's going mm. on in that scene. Mm. Well, you know, that's a Super 8 shot, you know, right. you know, it's got half a dozen shots of you know, some family members that they produce to, to create that, you know, insert part of that movie. Mm -hmm. One, one question has just come through on the chat asking if the hologram shots in Star Wars were, were Super 8. I don't think so. I, I, when I saw the movie, this was for the last, when I actually went to see the production that we worked on, I didn't see any footage in there that I could identify. Mm -hmm. So I don't always know in the production whether we got cut, you know, and, and it's on the mm. edi editing floor, so to speak, mm. or whether there was never a purpose for the movie itself, but it was a part of like the making of, um, you know, okay. you've got sub productions that come off of major productions. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, you're gonna have a making of a uh, documentary that's gonna be two hours long about it. So they need a lot of footage. And sometimes mm. in the making of it's kind of, interesting to have these sort of segue shots you know you see the sprocket and then it's like you, you know you're, you're talking about it from a you know from a documentary standpoint mm -hmm. and then you show the actual shot so the, these make great lead-ins and trail outs to stuff mm -hmm. so it could have just been part of that design or you know mm -hmm. maybe someone on set you know that someone wanted to give a camera to uh you know <laughs> you never really know right you know like where it's going to be right 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 um you, you have a very close relationship with kodak um and um do you know can you tell us anything about their future plans for the medium are they keeping in uh keeping up to date with what 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 people want and what they what they need yeah they keep uh you know reinforcing to me that super eight sales are still growing uh so in 
uh, just from an economic standpoint, something that grows is worth, you know, continuing with. Hmm. Uh, I've always tried to present the fact that if you don't have eight, you probably won't in the future have 16 and 35 because you'll never have somebody starting out. So right. you know, you'll eventually wipe the whole thing out if you don't continue to promote something that sources new blood into the filmmaking process. Mm. And Super 8 is really that, that first stepping stone towards, you know, someone, you know, developing a career mm. in film or moving into 16 millimeter or, you know, yeah. so, you know, it's kind of critical mass to them. Right. Uh, and I think as a company, you know, not that I'm a, you know, a, in terms of corporate, you know, Wall Street stuff, but as a company, they, they are a film company and, and they need to maintain that identity. And I don't think they can walk away from film for that reason alone, because it's who they were and it's who they are. And if they give mm -hmm. that up, they kind of, from a brand standpoint, I think it would really be detrimental to them to walk away from film. Mm -hmm. you know, it really stands them out. Oh, and, and, you know, it's their heritage, mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. So I think they'll hold on to it even if it doesn't make money. You know, it'll, yeah. it'll still be there. Well, um, one other thing I one thing I I want to draw attention to is the amazing work that Pro 8 Millimeter does in in refitting and rebuilding basically uh, Super 8 cameras from the ground up because of course you know as that Synchronex uh, camera shows you know the shooting on Super 8 is only as only as good as the cameras that you're able to use and so many of the old cameras are kind of you know nearing or part, some parts of them are nearing the end of their useful lives and and if and eventually all the original ones are just going to break down i know some are longer lasting than others but the fact yeah. of the matter is is that pro 8 have been taking film uh, cameras like this one the uh, the bolia for professional the 6 608 is it 6008 yeah. and yeah. and rebuilding it as a max 8 which by the way i'm going to show in a minute but that's that's to maximize the the frame to make it a 16 by 9 rather than 4 3 um, you also do the rebuild the the, the classic Bolia 4008 ZM2, um, the Canon 814 Auto Zoom, which I'm pleased to say I have, and then of course the Ronda Cam, the Canon 310, which is uh, rebuilt as the Ronda Cam, which is uh, which is a lovely little camera. I have one that doesn't work. Uh, you you can have it if you want. You <laughs> if you want to build it. <laughs> I need the parts. Oh, yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, I'll send it over. Um, All right. But I was um, going to say that's 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 for me that's one of the most exciting things that Pro 8 does is is the actual rebuilding of cameras because you know these cameras that you work on are going to last a lot longer than the originals, and and therefore you know even even after you and I have gone these cameras will probably uh, be the ones that you make will will probably be still working, and that's very exciting for the uh, for the, for the future of the medium. But I was yeah. that leads me on to that um, a question about the Kodak, the famous Kodak Super 8 camera. Do you have any information? Do you know what, when if that's ever going to come out? You know, about 18 months ago, they went completely dark about any information about that to anybody. Right. So there's been absolutely nothing said about the production of the camera in a year and a half. But there has been some projects that have been done using the camera, and you'll see some stuff that that's been out there in the world it's, that, that actually used the camera. It's so, yeah, very uh, enticing footage has come out. Look, making some of the results I've seen off of that the the the, the, the tests they've done. So it's it's kind of a tease, you know. They, they, we, we see some footage from it, uh, mm. you know, in terms of the lab we have here processing it and scanning it. And, Mm. projects that we know that are but we have hear nothing about the camera in mm. terms of like is it coming when's it coming how mm. much is it coming for like nothing that uh, absolute radio silence even uh, with your contacts you can't get a my contact it's uh. like nope <laughs> <laughs> uh. <laughs> um, maybe, you know maybe that's a strategy of some sort you know they they get all that publicity for it and then they didn't come out with it so then it was a little embarrassing so maybe, right you know, they don't want to say anything until they're ready to go or maybe they dropped the whole idea altogether. Mm. i really don't know um 
what what we decide to do is you know exactly like your experience you mean you can do it one of two ways you can either go on ebay buy a cheap camera hope that it works uh you know you have that experience and if it fails you get another one and and it fails, you know, because there's a bunch of things inside these cameras that really need to kind of been gone over again. Mm -hmm. So instead of going through it that way, we buy the cameras off eBay, we strip them down, we mm -hmm. rebuild them back the way they should be. Mm -hmm. And the reliability then returns to the camera because now you've kind of addressed all the issues that they've accumulated over the last 50 years. Mm -hmm. That's so you know, a 4,000A, which that is, you know, now classic, mm. you know, that went almost 50 years. So yeah. rebuilt, it should probably go another 50 years. There's nothing in there that really, uh, you know, is going to deteriorate. It's metal and glass and mm. lubrication. And, uh, you know, it should go another 50 years without a problem. Well, I hope so. I mean, I really, you're, you're doing God's work, I got to say. <laughs> Um, it's just so labor intense. I wish I could oh find God. a way to do it faster. That that camera oh. takes a week. You know, one guy oh working on it for forty hours to like go from a four thousand eight to a classic. It's just mm. you know, it's, when, it's a lot of time. In fact, I have some old some old footage of you uh, of um, let's see where is it? Is it this one? Of um, of uh, I was I found it on your YouTube. Oh, maybe that, this is not it. But of 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 the uh, oh this is old uh, this is the sound oh, okay this isn't this isn't it this is some uh, amazing old film of I found on your uh, YouTube yeah you know who made that film uh, no Kodak oh, okay <laughs> oh, interesting um, I, I always I always wondered though they made this whole film about how it was professional to make Super 8 films but they shot it in sixteen. Oh, okay. Well, I, I, <laughs> I, I thought, hey, if you're going to make a film about how it is professional and doable to make Super 8 movies, yeah, why don't you shoot it on Super well, 8? Like, if you want to yeah, yeah. prove this point, why not do it? But they didn't. They, they made a really nice film, but they did it 16 millimeter. <laughs> well, that, that brings us nicely on to this film that um, you made. I'm sure this was... Um, and uh, it was... Oops. Is it working? Um, as the um, of converting the Max Eight. Hang on a minute. There, oh, yeah. there we go. There's, we have to. Let's turn the volume down a bit on that. But yeah, I'm sh this was this was Super Eight, right? This was uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It made sense to me to shoot something in Max Eight of making Max Eight. Yes. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So these are all the steps for all of you watching. These are the steps necessary to widen the gate of. I think this was a. Was it the Bolio or the? Yeah, anyway, um, to make it um, to make it into the into the widescreen, the format that we know that we know these days. That was kind of uh, you know a spin-off of uh, several feature film productions because when we do feature films that use Super 8, one of the big problems is matching the aspect ratio. Sure. Yeah. Super is kind of a square, and most movies in the theater are more like rectangles. Yeah. So what would happen is even though the professionals wanted the look of Super 8, they wouldn't frame it very well relative to their screen size. So mm -hmm. uh, I think John Toll was the first one to say, look, you need to give us some kind of viewfinder marking inside the camera so we can see where the frame of Super 8 is going to translate to the frame of, you know, 35 millimeter. Mm -hmm. So we put in this sort of crop line thing you just oh, start right. I think I just got a uh... so you could see where the frame was. Let's get, let's get and the, then they were go. doing a lot of stuff with anamorphics. So we would squeeze the picture on the Super 8 to put it in a 35. Ah, movie. yes. But that, that required unsqueezing it to get it in the movie. And those anamorphic lenses, although they're really cool and fun, they're really hard to work with. You know, I have, to, I have you some know, footage here from this. It's so wide, it's going to, it's going to, cut you off from the picture oh, but, uh, oh, <laughs> but that's this amazing that's that's the uh um what are, what are we looking at here this is this is oh this was with the ultra double super eight isn't it this is an interesting new idea this is to shoot on double super eight but fill both frames with picture across 
Right, so it's a 16 millimeter wide film yes. and eight so, millimeters tall. Yep, yeah, because it's double super eight. So it's yeah. two sides. Instead of using it, the way you would normally use it is you shoot down one side and flip it over the way the old yeah, scene yeah, works. Yeah. But instead of doing that, you're doing a picture across both frames. So that's right. producing a bigger than cinemascope picture. Okay. Uh, cinemascope's two, three, five. That's three point one. Wow! And so you get the you get the full um, uh, resolution rather than you know using an anamorphic lens to s squeeze it in, squeeze it yeah, up. Yeah, anamorphics are just hard to work with on the amateur level because they you know they're not you know you hold this lens in front of another lens, mm. so you got to build a bracket holder to hold it and. I mean, I did it with uh, several major motion pictures, like uh, Flatliners. I don't know if you remember that old film. Oh, yeah, I remember that. The uh, Julia Roberts yeah. and Kiefer Sutherland film. Yep, yeah, yeah, all I that uh, dream flashback stuff is all Super 8 shot, anamorphic oh. Super 8. And uh, you remember that, that film, the, the Femme Nikita, but they made a yes. 35 movie? Uh, yeah. The Point of No Return. So that there's an opening sequence in there that's all super eight and shy mm. anamorphic. But, you know, like, I mean, the guys were pulling their hair up trying to work this <laughs> super eight anamorphic camera. So right, right, what right. we decided to do is rather than do anamorphic, we cut the gate out of uh, the aperture more in the camera. Mm. So that's where the max aid comes, you know, rather than try to like squeeze it, let's try to fill more of the frame with picture. So oh. nowadays, you know, most of the movies after those got made with Max right. and then with a crop line. So they knew where the, where the framing would be. Sure. Sure. But that's brilliant. The whole thing is like a whole new, like kind of, you know, we started getting into the double super eight again because yes. we wanted to use the double super eight film to make prints. Mm. So we ah. wanted to come from something to Super 8, rather than always going from Super 8 to something else. You know, go back right. the other way. I think I have a, a picture here of the, um, of the, of the camera that you, uh, that you used for that. Let me have a look here. Um, oh yeah, okay, so here's some pictures of um, you, of your, uh, your staff preparing films to, to send yeah, out, film Super stock. And there's yeah. some, a whole bunch of stuff, looks like it's come back to be developed. Yeah. And there's the uh, the developing machine. Yeah. Just I think it's brilliant that you do end to end Super 8. You know, you're fully self contained. Yeah. Well, is... you can't. I found when I first got to LA that that was the part of the film industry I think that was the worst conceived. That mostly you bought the film from Kodak, you shot it, you took it to Photochem to process it, mm -hmm. and you ran it down to Hollywood to one of those high end post facilities to scan it and you know so you went you bounced around town in mm. order to do anything which was good you had the, the best of each but when any ever anything went wrong everyone just blamed the other guy so right. you, you had terrible problems trying to sort out issues now on a professional level it kind of worked but as mm. you started to apply this to less professional people they, they just got so frustrated they gave up so mm by putting it together where you could like tell the guy, Oh, you started here, you ended here. If this went wrong, it was this or this. And you, and you were responsible for that. It really created a, you know, an environment where you could easily work mm -hmm. rather than, like I said, going all over town trying to figure all this stuff out. I mean, yeah. Today and then we have this new thing that we we just came out with called Sprocket and Sprocket ah. is kind of like, our version of an assistant producer. We have we have this great this great footage here. Yeah, um, that is a commercial some one of our customers did for it. This so is... the idea here is you don't know anything about film, but you were trying to do film. So you just log online, and this sprocket um, walks you through what you might need out of your Super 8. You know, in terms of processing turnaround time, scanning, whether you want to ship it back to London or have a copy of it sent to your customer in Australia. You know, like you can coordinate the whole film workflow through this 
app. And so you don't really need to like hire a, an assistant producer to like work in film. You, you can kind of handle it yourself because you've got Sprocket there to help you. And, and he can figure stuff out for you. Like mm. how big's your file gonna be when you scan Super 8 to ProRes 444, mm. you know, you're like, cause you wanna send it to, over the internet to, you know, somebody and it costs based on how many gigs there are. There's a lot of math and a lot of coordinating that has to go into film typically. Yeah, yeah. But the idea with Sprocket is now you could just do it with your app and you just concentrate on your shooting mm. and, and Sprocket will help you figure out the rest. Well, I can see, I can see the definite business uh, sense in keeping everything you know, in-house end-to-end because then your, your customers stay with you for the entire process. They don't try and yeah. shop around. Um, but, I mean, this is... Uh, um, let me see. What have I? Yeah, the um. Do you... oh yeah yeah. What so what? If... What about your relationships with other uh, uh, Super Eight companies worldwide? There aren't that many left. Is it no. still a is it still a very competitive field, or um, no. is is everyone kind of cooperative? I think we all gotten older, and so we don't we don't like we're not in that those you know we're not that when we were young and more aggressive and more competitive, you know. But right. I, I know Ludwig at, you know, Andek very well and go visit him, you know, in Germany. And, mm. um, uh, I, you know, I, I, there's a lab in Boston uh, that, you know, the, that I know well. And sometimes even, you know, we've done some things for one another, you know, uh, mm. you know, a processing machine breaks and you have to, you know, get that stuff done. You know, mm. you might have to go, you know, go talk to one of these, you know, to work together. Hmm. Um, there's a few people I don't get along with, you know, we don't share the same philosophy of like customer relations. Yeah, and, I could, I could name stuff a few, like that. I so, could name some names, but, um, just now, like anybody. Yeah. Now for a while yeah, you, yeah. um, you set up here in London. I've got some, yeah. um, uh, in golden uh, square of all places. That's where, um, that's, a, that's pretty much the, uh, heart of the British film industry. And um, in fact, I think yeah. Paul McCartney has an office there. His, uh, did, I don't know if you ever saw him, but um, um, do you have any other, uh, any plans for future international expansion? Uh, that was a pretty uh, interesting experience. Uh, I had a, a guy who had written a book about Super 8 and he was trying to publish his book and he really needed a job. So I kind of worked with him to, you know, kind of help him with his book publishing by allowing him to run an office in London. Mm -hmm. So that's how that got started. Mm -hmm. uh, and so eventually it grew and I, I, I wound up having to go there myself and run the office. Um, uh, it, it's, uh, it was wonderful to like spend time in another country and get to know a different culture and do all that kind of stuff. It's just hard to, to, to be in two places at once. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, um, you know, what, what I was doing there was really exciting, and then what was happening here was suffering because I wasn't around to, um, sure. to help out with what goes on here. So hmm. I don't know if I'd open another office again. Well, I, a, I, a, a question's come in. A couple of questions have come in. Um, this is an interesting one. I, I should have asked this. Um, Ichabod to ask anyone training up younger folks as Super 8 camera technicians? Actually, I have a young lady who's like uh, working on cameras right now. Uh, she's starting with the Ronda cam. She's been at it for about six months. Um, yeah, I think that's the future. Okay. Uh, Definitely. I hope to get another one going and I got some plans on some other things on how to expand on the camera side of things it's it's quite busy um even if for example kodak does come out with this camera i, I their last projection was that it was kind of an expensive camera i think it was in the two or three thousand dollar range so yeah. Yeah. uh actually the majority of the camera sales are more like the 500 to one thousand dollar range right. so that that's really what i'm concentrating on is to try to provide reliable you know, five hundred to one thousand dollar cameras. Mm. I, I mean, it's cool to have the 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 very expensive, you know, kind of 
does everything kind of camera, but really the market has always been with, you know, people who are looking to, uh, they're interested in, you know, and breaking them from, you know, into the field of photography and movies through a medium that really they can afford. Hmm. So, that, you know, that's what Super 8 Sound was all about before I took over. You know, it's about schools hmm. and teaching film. Hmm. It, it's still the same thing. We just would build more bridges with, you know, different groups. But, you know, the, the intro person is still the heart of the machine. I've, I've got the most amazing picture that from your website. Oh, firstly, there's this, which is, oh, my God, that there's one that will get, get make me uh, make me jealous. This is uh, That's the incredible. Doc yeah, this is. The, <laughs> but um, but there's this one as well, which is like you've you've supplied 10 Super 8 um, what Canon 1014 XLS. Yeah. Yeah, that's a school program here and, in uh, the Los Angeles area. That's pretty into Super 8. I just, that's I just love the fact that there's ten of those out there now, and I, I know that those students are going to put them through hell. But, yeah. but I, I really hope at the end of that, there's some that they're still working. Um, Yi Yi Chang Sun says, "Hi Phil, this is Gandalf. I don't know if you know someone called Gandalf, but he's, uh, huh? he's watching now." Um, and. Um, uh, oh yes, that's right. We're going to talk about your film out um, okay. process now. Oh yeah, there's the uh, there's the, an old Bolex who you you were the I double double Super Patrick, Eight, wasn't it? I think that's Patrick Mullen. I think. Okay. I think he's a German uh, art filmmaker. Okay. Uh, he has some very uh, interesting stuff. Hmm. Yeah, the film out thing is kind of a an interesting uh, thought of like. Uh, you know, like I say, does everything have to go from film to digital? What about going from digital to film? Yeah, well, what exactly. What about the world of projection? What about the world of incorporating other things into a Super 8 film? Like maybe you have some six, I, I did a, a reduction print yesterday. I was just looking at it before I came on, but I was really happy how well it came out. Mm. It shot on 16, a piece of film shot on 16 negative then printed to super eight reversal. So, you know, that, that kind of uh, bridge between things and mm. like all the opportunities there might be. Oh my God. Yeah. It, it totally opens up, opens up the field. I should say to people watching that the top um, right hand corner here is the original negative from super eight. And then the rest of the picture was digitized and then printed back out to super eight, which, and, you know, to be honest, it, it looks damn near the same. It's uh, the, it doesn't look like you've lost any, any, um, any resolution there at all. Yeah. There's a little loss, just like that's normal kind of, you know, uh, analog to analog, you know, in the old days we used mm. to you know, have to deal with the fact that every time we made a copy of something, we lost a little, Yeah. You know, not like the digital era. But now but, here, and, and here you've got um, a, a film that had gone kind of, um, you know, um, it had gone all magenta from age and that you scanned it, color corrected it, and then printed it back out to super eight. Right. So you could fix things like that, you know, like old magenta prints, you know, and, and make new ones of them or, you know, something in your archive that's, uh, you know, really important to you mm -hmm. in film. I mean, there's a lot of film projecting that goes on in Europe. Um, you know, there's a lot of uh, clubs and, you know, uh, even in, you know, not just in Europe, but in the United States, there's, you know, uh, you know, there's the main film industry where the big budget films are being released at the mall and that stuff. But there's also like film projectors everywhere, you know, mm -hmm. in terms of like uh, art house cinemas and cities and uh, schools and, you know, so projecting on film is not completely out of uh, the loop of things, so, but you have to have stuff to project. Mm. Well, it's, it's, you know, we it's, started it, revamping a Super 8 projector because we've been doing the cameras and uh, we realized, well, you know, all they have that someone would be able to project is what they generated themselves. What made the old projector system kind of cool was you could get a film of something. You could get some pornos and watch them. You could get, you know, 
some mm. cartoons to show the kids. You could yeah. do stuff with a projector beyond just what you created. Mm. So what I'm kind of hoping is that uh, if we can develop this film out kind of idea, there'd be, you know, sort of uh, uh, new ways to use film, you know, out there in the world. Mm. Um, someone, um, someone asks, where will we find Super 8 print stock and print, print machines? Uh, was, that, was that done on an on a, a optical printer on Ektachrome? Yeah, uh, this, is a, this is a digital to film process. So it's very similar to the, the machine I have behind me that's mm. going the opposite way. That's going from film to digital. Mm. And now we're going the other way. We're going from digital to film. So we're using a camera, we're actually using a Bolex uh, um, double Super 8 camera to do the capture of the picture. Okay. So anything that is existing on digital can then now be put back out, film out to Super 8. Amazing. So maybe even just like uh, leaders, you know, if, if you wanted a nice uh, classic leader to put on the head of your right. Super right. 8 movie that you created, you wanted the a countdown, you know, like a traditional count, you know, you could you could have that stuff if you have a, a means to go from digital to Super 8. Hmm. You know, they have this in 16 and 35 for major motion pictures. It's the, you know, the foundation of the entire film industry is to like be able to go from film Put it on digital, do some stuff to it, and then put it back out on film. But we don't, we never had that in Super 8, really. Mm. Yeah. And this I, would put it in, in, in our capacity as, as Super 8ers to like have that kind of tool that, you know, it's sort of like the negative process. You know, we, we decided to cut 35 down to Super 8 because Super 8 filmmakers didn't have access to probably the most important and powerful filmmaking resource there was on the planet you know mm. 35 millimeter negative film mm. um, and you wanted to give it to them well this this kind of brings me on to um a, a question which i i like to ask people because it gets all sorts of reactions um <laughs> which is what's your opinion on um digital effects and apps that seek to mimic the look of super 8 is there any use for them are they helping to keep super 8 in the public consciousness or are they the work of pure evil it's funny you ask that because I've just spent the last week or so emailing back and forth with some guy who's doing it and he's, he wanted me to help him. And at first I was like, oh my God, I got to go through this whole intellectual debate in my own head. Am I like selling out the soul of what I do uh, by working on this? Uh, you know, what, what is it, you know, kind of stuff. Um, and I'm, I'm not, you know, because I, I haven't really sort of gone through the whole process, so I'm not exactly sure, but I can say on, on some level, it brings people into the world of Super 8 because, you know, clearly, you know, as filmmakers trying to do things in film, it's becoming more and more obscure and you, you can, you can obscure yourself out of existence if you're not, if you're not careful. So this brings, you know, if there's that many people who are interested in it, then, you know, bring them in. So we, you know, they, they can see. And having done some of it with them, you know, I, I created a green screen with a frame. So you could just do a, you know, flip the image in through green screen and then made some grain mats so that you could throw mat, a grain over it. And then made some dirt and scratch mats. So you could throw those over it, you know, with, you know, any editing program. Uh, you know, it never really looks like Super 8, you know, it, it yeah. like, there's just too much other character to it, like with the way the light comes into the camera and the flares and the, just the whole thing. You just, it, at first when you look at it, if you didn't compare it to something actually done in Super 8, you'd probably go, hey, hey that looks kind of like Super 8. But yeah. the minute you put something that actually is Super 8 next to it, it's like, oh my God, it looks like crap. You know, so <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I, like I, I, of it in terms of you know like this is the way i look at it i'm in hollywood there's more money than ever been thrown at images ever you know in the history of you know humanity here and those guys still use things like super 8 to create a scene in their movie 
So mm. if, if it could be done, they can do it. Mm. But they don't do it. Why? Because it really, A, can't be done that well, and B, takes more effort to do it that way than it does to go shoot the thing in the first place on Super 8 film. Yeah. yeah. Well, right? yeah. If, if, they, if the big guys could do it, they wouldn't bother, you know, mucking around with, you know, having to deal with the, all the difficulties of using a 50-year-old Super 8 camera, I can tell you right now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I've, I found in many cases the the Super 8 emulation, the filters and the uh, the phone apps that you get, they they seem to mostly just want to overlay dust and scratches, and maybe yeah. maybe they they kind of uh, bump up the uh, saturation a bit and yeah. grain, and then they say there you, there you go, there's a Super 8 look, and then yeah. I, I I, the number of times I've had to sort of people have shown me like they've seen me with my bolia and they say, Oh, I can do that on my camera. And then they show me. And, uh, and then I think they're trolling me really. I don't think they're, uh, they, they just want to get me riled up because I start in on a whole lecture about how, about, about, um, what's called dynamic range and, and, and color palette and how, you know, grain, like natural grain. And when they, you know, and then they, 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 Basically, I, I, I always rise to the bait, and they're always sorry that they brought it up. <laughs> well, you're a better arguer than I. I. I remember when I first got involved in this, you know, this is back in the 70s, right? Mm. And uh, I had my Super 8 camera at, a, at a, like a, a store looking for a case to put it in. And the guy in front of me had just bought a video camera, you know, VHS, you know, the big old thing. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so he... You know, we're waiting in line to check out, and he's like, what are you doing with that old relic, you know? <laughs> I mean, this is 77, you know? Like, he's like, that stuff's, you know, history, you know? Like, you need to buy, you know? And he just went off, you know, on, like, right. all the virtues of VHS uh, <laughs> video making and how he was saving all his money because, you know, like, you know, he's giving all the money for film, and I, I was an idiot, you know, that I, I didn't see this and everything. <laughs> so... That, that argument has been going on now for the 40 years I've been involved in it, you know? Mm -hmm. And I, I just realized, you know, after I left that store and, and was kind of frustrated because I'm not a great arguer like that. Um, and then this very good um, filmmaker came in and, and wanted to buy a camera for me. And she created this absolutely gorgeous movie about her grandmother and everything. And I, I realized, there's just different kinds of people out there. There's mm -hmm. those who really understand the authenticity of doing something and have a talent and a skill and can can create beautiful things with uh, with a camera. And then there's other guys who are just trying to impress you with what they just purchased. Yeah. Well, listen. Let me let let's see that guy who was buying that video camera. Let's see what his VHS tapes look like these days. The ones he shot back then, which yeah. uh, which <laughs> which actually brings me to my um, one of my last questions, which is um, your wife, Rhonda, has been um, performing an important role in the preservation of Super 8 archives, um, uh -huh. commercial and private. Um, she's also the author of uh, Get Real about your home movie legacy before it's too late. Snappy uh -huh. uh, title there. And uh, of course, um, she's the one the Rhonda Cam is uh, named after. Yeah. So my question is, who does the filming at family events? You or her? Uh, <laughs> Mostly, I think I've got the camera. Mm. Uh, although, yeah, she has, she has no problem taking it from me and, you know, starting to go shoot and stuff like that. Mm. Uh, I, I think she's really uh, keyed into the fact that a large part of, you know, the interest, you know, in our business became archival stuff. And as, you know, you know, we'd get calls from, you know, major celebrities uh, thinking that, you know, I'm thinking, oh, my God, I'm going to get to work with uh, Steven Spielberg on something. Mm. And uh, what they really want is me to preserve, you know, the original eight millimeter films that he shot, you know, uh, when he was a kid. And the, and the work and the connection all became much more about the preservation of his legacy relative to film right. than going out and getting a chance to go shoot a movie with him. Mm. So as that kept happening, you know, through more and more celebrities, we, she sort of realized that that was as big a part of the business as, you know, what I thought was important, which was, you know, the shooting. 
Mm -hmm. So I, I think she's really helped me balance out that as a company mm -hmm. and realize, you know, we probably generate, you know, half of our revenue from, you know, people who are archiving their, their past history. And then through those relationships, some of them have wound up shooting things in their movies. You know, there's this super eight stuff in Steven's new movies too, you know, now, mm -hmm. and, you know, stuff comes up and it's like, you know, you become connected and they realize, Oh, you know, there's still some resource there. We could use that for something. Mm. Uh, so it's been great, but the, but the majority of the business part of it has been more in the archiving of those projects. Really? Really? You know, amazing. like uh, even the movie, let's say the movie super eight, we had a few scenes in that super eight movie, but all the people that are in that movie, the director, the producer, the editor, all those guys, JJ Abrams, all had Super 8 movies that they had shot. So we wound up remastering as part of the budget of the movie, all the their films. Oh, and wow. so it became a warm part of their whole like process of making a movie like this to have all their own authentic, you know, original films. Oh. And, you know, I'm sure they partied hardy, you know, about, you know, like sharing, you know, hey, you know, and I, I have to admit, you know, I've seen it with, you know, a lot of people, there's, uh, there's a lot of their history tied up in this, you know, right. so, you know, doing something like an archive project uh, brings people back together, you know, and it reconnects you with, you know, your, your college roommate, you know, that you made a film with, you know, when you're at school and How it, it's a great natural way to bring people back together because you say, hey, you know, I'm just not calling you out of the blue. I call, I'm calling you up because I'm doing this thing, which is I'm going to try to fix up our old movie that we tried to make in freshman year in, in school. And, and I'm going to put it on digital and I'm going to redo the title. You know, it, it's a it's a beautiful process uh, for people to be together. Yeah, yeah. My, my daughter's at art school at the moment. My oldest daughter's at art school and, um, and her and her friends, they, they love Super 8. And they, of course, now, now they they've got a contact i.e. me to uh, develop their films for them you know they've, right. all, they've been really inspired to to shoot more stuff like the stuff i i showed before i was interested in what what jj abrams early super eight was like did he, did he show talent did he show some some promise um uh, yeah politically i probably shouldn't say anything like that okay, yes, but <laughs> okay. Majority of, I, I i once said to someone because i've transferred the first films of a lot of people um, that if you were to take, and these are like the A-list guys, if you would take all those guys with first films and put them together with a, an average class of people from, you know, one of the local schools that has a film class, I am sure that you couldn't pick out which ones would be which. Right, right. Yeah, it's, it's just it, good it, to put it, the hours in and the time it, it's in. A, it's a progressive process. I did have a great experience one time with... Um, Oh no, his name escapes me. Um, Stanley Kubrick? The Evil Dead. Oh, J Sam Raimi. Sam Raimi. Oh, okay. Great, yeah. so Sam started out making Super 8 films. Mm -hmm. And at one point, one of his, the, the guys who made films with him, Bruce Campbell yeah. and Scott, Scott Spiegel, I think it was Scott that came in, and he remastered all of their films. Mm -hmm. And I started transferring the first films that they made like the very first roles of Super 8 they ever shot, up through a movie called Within the Woods, which is basically Evil Dead shot in Super 8. It's like the 50-minute right. yeah, yeah. version, right? Yeah, yeah. And it was such an experience because over a week, I, I watched how someone goes from not really understanding how film language works to starting to get it to as each movie progressed, the suspension of disbelief kept getting bigger and bigger. Mm. And by the time we watched Within the Woods, I mean, we were all like scared to death, like <laughs> watching that film, it was, you know, so spooky. Mm. And I was like, you know, this is how you learn this process. You, mm. you go through it, you know, it's not like, like regular language where you're at school and you learn all your vocabulary and stuff like that. It, it's more of it's done, you know, like what your daughter's doing with by, by experimentation, mm. by you know progression, by putting time in, by making contacts, by doing mm. projects mm. after projects, 
So it, it was nice to see, you know, someone go from nothing to the guy who makes major motion pictures and see how he actually, you know, yeah. kind of progressed in that I, area. I seem to remember an early story about the making of Evil Dead, that, that they would take that within the woods film on a projector and, and just yeah. go around and screen it for possible investors and like yeah. just just like hardware store owners and and all sorts of people yeah. who and that the because it was on super 8 and a projector it was reasonably portable and it wasn't mm -hmm. like you could show a a a, 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 a a a sizzle reel on an ipad to them those days that you they'd have to go yeah. in and set up a projector and and show it to, to raise money that's how they did it they raised uh, almost three hundred thousand to really shoot that thing in 16 because they they were going to make because they were trying to do a drive-in movie and before that film most of their films were more uh three stooges style comedy movies mm -hmm. uh, a lot of their efforts were all in the comedy sector so but then mm -hmm. when they got to where they wanted to actually go commercial they realized they had to make something that would sell in the drive-in so they decided to switch over and try to make a horror movie Right. But you can kind of right. tell that their comedic overtones just Definitely. Couldn't, yeah. Yeah. didn't stay out of the process. They oh, just yeah. couldn't help themselves by, you know, they were just too tied into the comedy of stuff. Yeah, yeah, and you I can see that, that in Evil Dead 3. There's there's a there's so much like people getting slapped in the face with skeleton hands yeah. and stuff. It is it is hilarious. Yeah. Oh. Oh. Well, Phil, you're a busy man. No. <laughs> I will um uh, we've been we've been going on so long. There's the, I'm going to leave the last question to the uh, to the audience, and um, it's uh, <laughs> um, let's see, where is it? I saw one here. Scott Chamberlain asked, uh, "How much would it cost to get a Bolia 4008 ZM2 cleaned and lubed?" I'm sure you'll. The answer is it depends. <laughs> well, we mostly just rebuild them completely, so it's about. Fifteen or eighteen hundred dollars to do in, to do the entire process. It takes about a week, uh, and that's converting over all the subsystems in the bullu that that we don't like, like the hand grip and and changing things that we just, you know, there there are things that break, and so we got rid of them so that you know when you went out and shot, you wouldn't have to worry about mm. the little power switch in the back of the hand grip going out in the oh, middle yeah. of your. Oh yeah, you know, yeah, so yeah I know all about that. We tend not to service them. We tend to focus on just rebuilding cameras. Right, brilliant. Well, listen, um, Phil, I've I've, I've um, learned so much today, and uh, I want to thank you very much for coming on the show. Oh, you're welcome. And I have to say, you know, in watching the beginning of the show, I think you're onto something really good because it, it this medium really provides an opportunity to show people what you're talking about. Yeah, rather than just writing about it or just talking yeah. about it you can see it well and thanks so, yeah i think i think so much more sense to be in this format and you know although mm -hmm. covid forced you probably into doing something like this i think uh in the end you're going to realize that it is probably a, you know we call it the covid silver linings <laughs> which are the new things that we're now doing because covid forced us to do something different mm -hmm. and now we're realizing hey, this is really a kind of a good idea to like do things this way. Yeah. And we're kind of glad that something, you're not glad, but we are appreciating the fact that something happened in the world that, that forced us to go change and for the better. So I, I think this is a fantastic uh, idea that you have here for the show. Oh, well, thank you. Thank uh, you. I'm, I mean, I want to I want to show the, the people out there that, you know, if just because I'm into film and Super 8 and stuff, it doesn't mean I'm a Luddite and I, I, I'm scared of technology, that, that it goes hand in hand, all the new technology with the old technology. And, oh, yeah. Um, oh, you, you have to know both. I mean, yeah. it's like, if you really want to function in the creative world, you have to be all knowing in terms mm -hmm. of what's going on because it, it requires it to make good film. You have to understand all the disciplines that come together to make a good film. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if you're trying to just do it digitally and trying to say, no, I don't need to learn all that other stuff. It's like, you're really doing yourself a disservice and you won't find yourself getting those jobs moving up the ladder because you need that all that ex that other information that's 
critical to mm. various parts of doing production. You you know the best way to do something. You're not just doing it the only way you know how. Yeah, and also yeah, and it definitely and Super Eight definitely gives you discipline as well, in terms of you know you you set your shot up and make sure it's all right before you start filming, because you know oh, that, yeah. that film is expensive. <laughs> Analog experience is a good one. Mm. Well, great. Well, thank you very much, Phil, for coming oh, on the show. And I right. um, hope to uh, chat to you soon. Uh, yeah, I'm we'll sure there's you. many, many things we can talk about for hours and hours. But, uh... <laughs> yeah, I could go longer than an hour. Okay. All right. Thanks, Speak Dan. to you later. Bye. Right. That was Phil Vision, everyone. My God, that was so great. Ah, oh, it's, uh, whoops. I had other stuff to ask Phil. And uh, because I tried to keep these shows to an hour, an hour and a half maximum, then, um, then you know, there's a limit to how much I can, uh, I can go on. Oh my God, what a show! It's been going on for ages now, and it's almost time now. In fact, it is time for the final, for the finale, for the uh, for the live Super Eight. Actually, it's Standard Eight this week for the Standard Eight film show. Yay! And here is something. I better turn some lights off now. Let's switch on the DSLR. Oh, oh dear. That doesn't look too healthy. Let's try now. There we go. Let's see. Let's put my hand in front to make sure. It, yep, yep. It is live. I'm live focusing on a piece of paper, which is going to act as my screen. Let's turn some lights off and watch something. Main light. There we go. We're getting somewhere now. Don't we all love the light switching off bit? Okay. Right. Tonight, you're going to have to just ignore those numbers at the top. If I try and switch it off, it'll, it'll, it'll crap out the entire picture. Tonight is, um, well, it's some more, it's some more scout footage. <laughs> I seem to have come into the um, possession of a bunch of Boy Scout films that were made in the 70s. I can't remember where I got them. I, I sometimes I buy lots, auction lots. Sometimes I get um, uh, uh, Super 8 projectors which have a bunch of films in them. I've tried to trace the people who filmed this stuff. Uh, never found them. So uh, yeah, let's just watch it. So what we've got here is some Standard 8 scouting footage. Hooray! I was never a Boy Scout. I don't like that paramilitary part of the uh, operation, but there you go. So here we go. All right, we've got some uh, some knot tying to begin with. <laughs> Obviously, the scoutmaster was uh, filming this for posterity. If you ever need to put a bunch of uh, I don't know poles together, that's uh, that's let's have some music with it. Okay, this is terrible music. Shut up and sit down. Where did I get this bunch of new metal music from? Oh, this will have to do. Oh. Talk about old technology. Wow, that must be a clove hitch he's doing there. Or maybe it's a sheep shank. <laughs> maybe it's a monkey's fist. I'm thinking of all the knots I know the names of. Oh, all the, all the audience are saying thanks, Phil. Thanks, Phil and Ben. Hey. Well, you're welcome. Uh, okay, we're going to end up with this uh, fascinating footage. I believe they're making some kind of tent or a stretcher. I don't know. This was shot on uh, lovely Kodachrome. Ah, there we are. It's 420th Scout Troop. Ho oh, ho! 420th. I wonder what they were up to. Get a special badge for growing stuff Hy hydroponically. <laughs> oh no, that was the end. <laughs> Oh, the 420 scouts are, uh, have finished tying stuff up and they're off for a bit of uh, 
R&R. &R. Surely there's more on this film than that. Yeah, this is a bit more. Oops. Oh, boy. Well, while nothing is going on... Oh! Whoa! What the hell's that? Pioneering. Ooh. What's he up to? <laughs> okay. That's uh, the pioneering... A mini pioneering project. A Roman catapult. My God, they're building a Roman bloody catapult. Ah, oh, yes. That's what... Here's mud in your eye. Here's what made... Made the British Empire... <laughs> Here's mud in your eye. I think they were filming a bit of... Uh, oh, look. There we go. Roman catapult. Alexander Mandash said it said Roman baliata. Did it? Well, this is what the... Here's what the 420 scouts are up to. This must have been like in the early 70s or so. Ah, this film was probably made around the time that Pro 8mm was founded. And I was born. Wow. How are they going to get that out the front door? Did anyone think of that? They're going to have to throw catapults into... I don't know. They're going to have to launch stuff into the wall. Hmm. Oops. There we go. That's better. Ah, oh, still looks as good as the day it was shot. What do we think about that, Kodachrome? Let's see, if you filmed video back in those days. First, dinnitting, dinnitting scouts. Oh, look, a little bit of animation. Isn't that nice? I wonder if there was a scout badge for animation. Maybe I can, I can find these people. First, dinnitting, dinnitting scouts. I don't know who that was. Oh, okay, are they gonna, oh, okay, they made a bridge. Not a catapult, so they made a rope bridge. And it works. Great. Hooray for scouts. I was never a scout. I was never a scout myself. I was a... Um, I was a... Uh, uh, my brother was a scout, and I used to take the piss out of that. Uh, right. Ging gang and all that. That's the end of Ben's camera show. Thanks again to Phil Vigent. Pro8millimeter.com. They are one of the last ones out there, and... Um, through their work, Super 8 will live on. Next week, quirky video devices. It might not be next week, might be the week after. Yes, we're going to take a little break from Super 8 and Standard 8 and 16 mil and film. I'm going to crack out, crack open a whole load of weird and wonderful video camera and still uh, digital, digital devices. Oh yeah, some weird stuff out there. Thank you all for tuning in. And that was Ben's Camera Show, the uh, seventh episode of season two and uh, i had great fun and now i'm gonna have me dinner thanks everyone for tuning in must have <laughs> ichabod said must have one of those thousand watt stun guns attached yes probably <laughs> i've roasted enough enough people with my uh with my with my thousand watt lamp in the past anyway bye all see you next week this was fun as usual and uh next week like i said Quirky video devices, bit of a change. And I'll see you all then. Bye bye. Cheers, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Now then, now then. <laughs>